Hello, everyone that's joining. I see there are 30 of you so far and more joining all the time. Thank you very much for everybody who's come back for a second time. Uh, thank you, Genival. Good morning to you in Brazil. Very early in the morning, I think. Oh, 6 a.m. Well, Genival, I'm flattered that you should uh, come to this, come to our lesson. Thank you, Ahmed. Good morning. Good morning, Maldale. Ah, good morning, Anna. Anna Kopenya. Are you in Tbilisi, Anna, or one of the uh, seaside towns in Georgia? Uh, yes, Anna, I, I, I've been to Tbilisi on training visits two or three times. Obviously, before the present situation, I've run training there in the centre at least two or three occasions. I haven't been for about three years, though, so I'm looking for another reason to visit. So hopefully when the lockdown finishes, I'll come back. I tend to spend most of my time in Eastern Europe and the Caucasus and the Middle East. So I'm very happy always to be in Tbilisi. Ah, then yes, Janiel, thank you very much. Yes, I, I, I'd love to visit your Serbia as well. Well, one minute past 10 UK time. There's 60 participants. Let's, uh, let's begin our lesson. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the screen, bring up a presentation containing elements of three of our other pre-recorded courses, contract drafting, legal English, and legal writing. And I'll talk you through the presentation. There will be some exercises for you to complete during the lesson. And later, you'll be able to, able to download the presentation to complete some of the unfinished exercises yourselves. We've also added the answers to the uh, version of the presentation which you will download. Well, this is our second lesson and thank you everyone who came back for a second lesson. Let me tell you what we're going to look at. First of all, we're going to look at one of the early sections from the early part of our contract drafting course. You can find the full course of 15 hours on our website, at the contract drafting and legal document page. What we're going to look at here, and this really is for those of you who are law students or who are very early on in your legal careers, I, I want to look at the basic structure of a contract. And I'm going to show you how to use the recital to better define your objectives in the contract. Many lawyers fail to use the recital properly. They don't really understand its significance. So we're going to cover it in this first 15 or 20 minutes. Right, well, we're going to look at the standard structure of a commercial contract. Now, signing a contract is serious for any party. They are legally binding agreements. You must write them with two things in mind. One, to achieve your objectives, to get what you want. That's great but it's only half the job. You must remember that things can always go wrong. So you must write the content of the contract to protect your interests, even if things go wrong. You write the contract on the basis of what can go wrong, and you write remedies for these problems into the contract. That's the best way to do it. Now, not all contracts have to be in writing, of course. In the common law, contracts don't have to be in writing. There are seven exceptions to this rule. Four of them you will never come across. I have never come across one of them in my entire professional career. This is where a lawyer lends money to a client where the client has inherited a large estate and does not wish to sell part of the estate to pay taxes. And I have to ask you, regardless of that extremely rare situation, have you ever heard of a lawyer lending their client money? So that's one of the exceptions we don't have to deal with. But one of the two, three of the exceptions you should be aware of are sale of land and interests in land. That could include rights of way or mining leases or the right to go fishing in the river. So mining leases, and sale of land and leases, they have to be in writing, to be enforceable. Doesn't mean it's not a contract if it's not in writing, just means you can't enforce it 
What's the point of having a contract you can't enforce? Now, insurance contracts must be in writing. Otherwise, you can't enforce them. They're so immensely complex with so many exceptions and exclusions, they must be in writing. Otherwise, people will never remember what they've agreed to. And the third type you should be aware of, which you might come across, are prenuptial agreements. Marriage is a contract. A prenuptial agreement is a contract. If it's not in writing, you can't enforce it. And again, what's the point of a contract you can't enforce? Now, having said that, I have to tell you, as a practicing lawyer, all commercial contracts should be in writing. And you'd probably be failing in your professional duties if you allowed your client to record a commercial deal without putting it in writing, merely shaking hands and then trying to remember two weeks later whatever it was you agreed to. So, to create a watertight contract, and by watertight I mean one which people cannot escape from, you have to understand the nature of the agreement. And the first question you have to be confident about is the legal question, what exactly is a contract? Well, in the common law, it is a voluntary agreement. A voluntary agreement between two parties, which, if it's valid, is binding on the two parties and it is enforceable through the courts. That's what we mean by binding. We mean you can't escape from it and if you do, we can get the court to make you perform it or to give us damages for your breach of the contract. So in other words, one party can sue the other if they don't do what they said in the agreement. Now, of course, in the common law, there are lots of contracts which aren't in writing. I buy some sweets at a sweet shop. I don't expect a written contract. I buy a bus ticket. I buy a metro ticket. I don't expect a written contract. There are lots of contracts which aren't in writing. But one of the obligation, one of the five requirements in the formation of a contract is the intention to create binding obligations. Now, what better evidence is there that you intended to be bound by the agreement than writing it down, calling it a contract and signing it? So that's why we put our contracts in writing. Now, these are the five essential requirements of a contract. I'm not going to go into them in detail now because this is the sort of thing you can find in our contract law course. But this is taken from one of the early, state, early slides of our contract law course. If any one of these five elements is missing, it's not a legally binding contract. It may not even be a contract. First, there must be an offer. One party must make an offer. It can be to another party, or it could be to the world at large, like a newspaper advert. Second, the offer must be accepted. Not a counteroffer, as an attempt to renegotiate the terms, but an acceptance of the offer as it was made. Next, you must intend to be bound by it. You must have the intention of legal consequences. These three things together make up what we call a meeting of minds. In Latin, we call it consensus ad idem. There were various arguments in the 19th and 20th century as to what this phrase consensus ad idem meant, a meeting of minds. How can I know if my mind has met your mind? Well, you can't. So what we really mean is both parties must know and understand what they are agreeing to. And then there must be something of commercial value passing between the two parties. We call this thing of commercial value consideration. Those of you who work in law companies receive a salary each month from your employers. That's their consideration. And in return, you give your valuable time and work. That's your consideration. It doesn't have to be cash, but it must have a commercial value. One ruble, one dollar, one dirham, one real has a commercial value. That's enough. It doesn't have to be equal to the value of the thing you get in return. We all possibly go into antique stores looking to find a bargain. We don't really want to pay the full price. But if the shopkeeper accepts our offer, it's a binding contract. And lastly, you must have the capacity to enter into a contract. The legal capacity in terms of a corporation being 
properly legally formed. And in human beings, the legal and physical capacity. For example, a child can't enter into a contract. A mental patient can't enter into a contract. A serving prisoner in prison can't enter. Uh, a bankrupt, while they are bankrupt, can't enter. You can't make a contract with a citizen of a state with which your country is at war. That's rather very relevant for the British, of course, because they're always fighting everybody. But you can't make a contract with the citizen of a state with which your country is at war. Now, let's have a look at the structure of a contract. Most contracts, whether they're, well, I say one page, whether they're two or three pages, 50 pages or 500 pages, whether they're written in Chinese, French, English, German, Portuguese, they're going to have the same structure. Every commercial contract tends to have the same structure. First, there is a preamble. This is where you introduce the parties, you name them and give their addresses. Then you have a definition section. If you've got more than five words that need defining, that are going to be given special meanings in the contract. And then you come to the recital. I want to spend a bit of time on the recital today. The recital is that section starting whereas. Most lawyers don't know how to use it. You should use it to explain the background to the situation and show why the parties are making a deal and what they're trying to achieve. And if there are important third parties who are not parties to the contract, but they're important in the contract, for example, the railway company that will transport the goods which you are selling to the other party, then this is where you should mention them. And then we come to the main body clauses. These are the clauses that contain the reasons why you entered into the contract, the money you want to get, the goods you want to receive, the goods you're going to deliver, the quantity, the quality, the dates of delivery, the terms for payment, how payment is to be made, what currency it's going to be in. All these really important things are contained in the main body clauses. And then if you're going to have one, because they are not suitable for every contract, if you're going to have one immediately after the main body clauses, you will have the liquidated damages clause. Liquidated damages are used a lot in the common law contracts. They're not always suitable for Sharia law contracts, although they're used greatly in the Middle East in relation to construction contracts, FIDIC contracts. They're not used, well, they're used, but not in quite the same way in contracts in the CIS region, where it's not prohibited to use a penalty clause. We can't have penalty clauses in the common law contracts. So liquidated damages are an attempt by the two parties to set the amount of compensation damages to be paid if one or both parties breach the contract in a particular way. It's an attempt to assess the likely cost of putting things right. And it's a shortcut to getting a judgment from a court if the other party breaches the contract. All you have to show is that the contract has been breached and that this is the amount or the way in which the amount is to be calculated to the judge. It's usually pretty easy to show a contract's been breached. Look, judge, the building isn't finished on time. Look, judge, the goods haven't been delivered. That's a clear breach. And then rather than having to prove the amount of your loss, you mention the amount in the liquidated damages clause and the judge gives you a judgment which you can then enforce. And then after that, we come to the housekeeping clauses, the boilerplate clauses, we call them. They're used in every type of contract. There are about 60. They're not suitable for every type of contract. Some should only be used in commercial agreements, commercial lease agreements, like a hell or high, high water clause, or in oil and gas leases, like a Mother Hubbard clause or a Pew clause. But the others, the governing law clause, the force majeure clause, the severability clause, the entire agreement clause. These are used in every contract, whether you're employing a footballer, buying a plane ticket, selling a house, forming a contract of employment. Don't cut and paste them from one contract to another. 
but use them as precedents and tailor them for your own individual contracts. And then finally, after you've written everything that you've agreed on, you sign the document in the signature blocks. This is where you sign, agreeing to be bound by the terms of the contract. So these are some things you must have in a contract. Otherwise, it's not a contract. You haven't yet reached an agreement. You haven't got to that consensus ad idem moment. You must clearly identify the parties. If I don't know who I'm contracting with, it's not a contract. I must clearly know what it is I'm giving and getting, the consideration. If I'm not certain what it is I'm getting, it's not a contract. And I must know the key rights and obligations. If they're not mentioned in the contract, then the judges will say, you haven't reached full agreement yet. It's not yet a contract. If it doesn't contain all of these things, it's not a contract. Now, those you must have. These you should have. They're not strictly necessary, but I'd be very disappointed with any of you that drafts a contract that doesn't contain these things, such as the date. Usually it's the date when it was signed. This may cause problems. What if you're in Dubai and your other contracting party is in Los Angeles? Well, if you sign it on the Monday, you'll have to send it by DHL and it won't reach Los Angeles for their signature until Wednesday. So what date does it start? Well, that for that reason, you might want to use a date of commencement clause in the contract, which states the date when the obligations under the contract start to avoid that confusion. And definitions. You may use industry jargon. You may want to give special meanings to words which have a different meaning in ordinary English. One day, if there's a dispute, the contract will end up in front of a judge who knows nothing about your industry, who will have to try and understand what you meant. Make it easy for the judge by defining the difficult words or the words to which you've given special meanings or jargon. For example, right now, for every one of you that is watching this course, I'm probably using 72 kilobits of broadband width. What on earth is a kilobit? That's the sort of thing I should define. Now, you should also have, if you've got more than five words to define, a definition section in the, near the beginning of the contract, before the whereas part. It explains exactly what the words mean. If you've only got five words or less to define, don't bother with a definition section, but define them immediately after the first time you use them in the contract. Now, it's also useful to have to protect your client and to ensure that you get what you want, to have indemnities, warranties, guarantees, representations and covenants. And in the contract drafting course in full, we spend two hours talking about these. I haven't really got two hours today to talk about them, but they're very useful and very important to make sure you get what you want and to protect your client if things go wrong. Now, let's draft out a contract very quickly and go through the parts. Well, here's the preamble. We're going to identify the contract by a name. We're going to call this one a building contract. It's not an employment contract or a sales contract. It's a building contract. You can see it's made and entered into, and then we put the date. And then we put the date when it commences. So presumably my other party is the other side of the world. We've got the effective date. And then I clearly identify myself. It's made between RB Limited. And here I put the company registration number. Very useful when you're dealing with companies to put their registration number. They are allowed to change their names. They're never allowed to change their registration number. And it's information which is freely available on the company's registry in whichever country the company was registered. And I put my address. That will be my registered office probably that I'm the first party. An XYZ Limited registered number, corporation, and then it's registered office, that's the second party. And then we'll move on to this preamble. This would say this recital, this recital. This is the thing I want to spend a few minutes on. This provides the background to the reasons why the parties wanted to make a contract. 
after reading the recital, it should be clear to you what it was they wanted to achieve. That way, you can ensure that the contract gets interpreted by the judges in a way that achieves the objectives of the party. Now, most lawyers don't pay this recital part any concern at all because usually it's not considered a binding part of the contract. They're quite right. But you can make it a binding part of the contract by explaining what it is or why it is you're making a deal and then using this sentence at the bottom of the slide. This recital is a part of the contract and its terms are binding. By doing this, you are tying the hands of the judges who come along to interpret the contract later because they can only interpret it in a way which gives effect to the objectives that they can clearly understand from the way in which you've written the recital. Let's have a look at one as an example. Whereas, now, first of all, whereas means the situation is, right? So having said it once, that's all you need to say. You don't need to say whereas first party does so and so, and whereas second party does so and so, and whereas they've agreed. No, just say it once. The situation is there's no legal importance as to whether I write it in capital letters or small letters. I've written in capital letters because most lawyers don't know that. And if I wrote it in small letters, they'd send it back to me, putting it in capital letters, thinking there was some important legal point they raised. Doesn't matter whether it's big letters or small letters. Right, now let's see if we can understand why they're trying to make a deal. Whereas first party is engaged in the manufacture of construction products described on Schedule A here too, these are the products, we put them in the schedule because although it's an integral part of the contract, I don't want to put a long list here where I've just started writing the words. So the products described on Schedule A here too, the products for use in the building industry. And second party is engaged in the business of marketing, selling, and distributing construction products within Kenya, which is the territory. And first party desires that second party markets sell and distribute the products in the territory. Right, that's it. Can you understand why they're making a deal? Of course you can. First party wants to sell more products in Kenya and second party's already got lots of contacts there to make sales. So it's pretty clear what we're trying to achieve, isn't it? Lots of sales of the products in Kenya. Right, if there's a dispute over the contract later and it comes before the court, we got to use that preamble to understand what we're trying to achieve. If I now finish it with the words, this preamble is part of the contract and its terms are binding, then the judges are bound by it. Now you'll notice we didn't add the details of the contract. We'll leave these for the main body. I don't put the percentage of commission I'm going to pay, or the term of the contract, how long it will last for, or how much it will be paid, or the minimum sales figures. I don't put any of that. We leave these for the main body. Now in the main body, this is the heart of the agreement what you expect from the other side and what you're gonna to provide to the other side. Key terms, the amount of consideration that you're going to get from each side, their ongoing rights, their responsibilities. So here's a typical lead in, much too wordy, but it's typical because it, it's used by a lot of lawyers because it tends to impress the clients. Now, therefore, in consideration of the mutual covenants herein contained, another good and valuable consideration the parties here too mutually agree as follows. Well, that's great, but I know you agree as follows because you signed it. You don't need all this. You could just say the parties agree as follows. When you sign the contract, in common law countries, it creates what are called three rebuttable presumptions. That is the court will assume, unless they see an overwhelming amount of evidence produced by the other side to counter this suggestion, that three things have occurred. Your signature indicates first, you have read the contract. Second, you have understood the contract. And third, you have agreed with the terms of the contract. And that is why you have signed it. Otherwise, why would you sign it? So no need to have all this long old fashioned lead in. You can just say the parties agree as follows. You don't technically need to say even that. But if I remove it, the lawyer on the other side will write it back in 
and rather than bother to explain to them just just leave it and let them let them think that you both understand the same now liquidated damages after the, the main body part we come to the liquidated damages you may not need one but if you do this is where you put it in genuine attempt by the parties to estimate the future losses in the event of a breach of contract and then the boilerplate clauses they are the typical clauses which you find in every contract they're not appropriate for all types of agreements but they play key administrative roles what is the governing law what does it say about arbitration is this the entire agreement what happens if a clause is bad because it's contrary to the law the severability clause and then finally we sign it the contract concludes with a statement of the party's intention to create a legally binding contract just to make it clear for everyone and then you sign it in witness whereof parties intending to be legally bound have executed this agreement as of the date first above written i don't even need to say that but again if i take it out the lawyer on the other side just write it back in so you know, don't start an argument just leave it there and then the parties sign and that's it that's the standard structure of a commercial contract you could find far more about all this on our contract drafting course and in fact before i move on let me show you something let me go to the contract drafting course here it is on our website now you can order a free trial lesson from it if you like click here saying choose course type click the free trial button it's zero dollars and add it to the cart okay now you've ordered a free trial lesson as you can see these buttons come up on the screen etc where you input your email address and then you can see here we've got lots of lessons recorded lessons and you'll get one of these free trial videos of the course right let's go back let's close that up don't forget by the way while i've got this in front of you don't forget to go and test your english click on this button at the top of the screen test your english it hopefully it's buffering good it then takes you to this page and you can take the free English test or the free legal vocabulary test. In our next lesson, I'm going to show you a free book, which I'm going to offer to everyone, provided they take a free test. Right, let's go back to our lesson. OK, let's bring up the presentation. Now, let's have a look at some grammar. I want to avoid nominalizations. Nominalization is an English teacher's word. It means taking a verb and turning it into a noun. For some reason, lawyers prefer to write with nouns rather than verbs. I don't know why, it's a failing. This causes many problems, as well as meaning more words in the sentence, and it also sounds very pompous. It's great if you're making a speech in public to use nominalizations, but not in writing. In a speech, of course, we're sounding pompous. We're trying to make people understand that we know what we're talking about. But when we're writing, it just makes us look pompous. And noun lawyers in particular seem to prefer to use the noun for the name of the process rather than to use the verb to state what is happening. For example, as we say, when a verb has been changed into the noun, we call it nominalization. In America, they call it smothered verbs. The whole purpose is Rather than using the verb, we're using a noun, which isn't really effective for good writing. Lawyers don't complete a matter. They arrange for completion to take place. They don't introduce people. They make an introduction. They don't provide money. They make provision for payment. And they don't investigate a matter. They cause an investigation to take place. Well, you can see it needs far more words. It takes you longer to do your work. So the problem with nominalizations is that they're often used instead of the verbs from which they come. And because they are the names of things, it sounds as if nothing's really happening. They make the writing very dull and very heavy, and clients in particular don't like it. Clients like the idea you're looking at their file every day and doing something with it. They don't like the idea that it's just sitting there and nothing happening. For example, we had a discussion about the matter. Well, we've taken the verb to discuss and we turned it into discussion. So it's the past tense 
What's the past tense of the verb discuss? Just write that in the chat box for me. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. I can see there are nearly 90 of us now. Let's have a look at your answers. It's pretty simple, of course. Let's have a look. Yes, Chiara, very good. Yeah, Apple, Zheng. Uh, yes, it's discussed. Well, let's now put it with the right verb. We discuss the matter. See how much shorter it is? Or in the last lesson, we talked about using the active voice. Here's the sentence in the passive. The implementation of the program has been done by the team. Well, who or what is the subject, the doer, the thing doing something? It's the team, isn't it? Let's turn it back into the active voice. The team has, what has the team done? Not implementation, the noun for the process. What's the past tense of the verb? Yes, let's have a look at a few answers. Great. I see you're all joining in, excellent. It's much more interesting for me when you join in. Otherwise I'm just lecturing at a blank computer screen. I haven't even got your smiling faces in front of me. Let's have a look at what you said. Implemented, the team has implemented, excellent Mahmoud, Slavic, very good Malik, very good Ahmed, very good Thinkpad, very good, <laughs> very good Emma. Well, here we are. Now look, we turn it back into the active voice and we avoid the nominalization. Now look how short the sentence is. Team has implemented the program. We must have cut off 40% of its length there. Right, so avoid nominalizations especially when writing to clients. They want to think that you're doing something with their file every day. Now, if you're going to use a verb, and here we come from a section from the Legal English course, you want to be precise. There's 350,000 words or more in the English language. Nobody really knows how many there are. We got words for everything. For example, we have a noun and a verb to describe the noise made by a turkey. What is that noise? Gobble, 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 gobble. That was a jollop. We even have a word for it. We've got a word for everything in the English language. That is the verb, to make the sound, make the noise made by a turkey. We have verbs for everything. It's possible when writing in English to be incredibly precise. And it's much more effective to be precise rather than using a vague verb and then having to amend it with an adverb to make it fit the sense. By being precise, you can cut down the number of words because you don't use adverbs, and you can make it clearer. For example, the diplomats worked at. Is that what diplomats do? They work at things? I don't think so. The diplomats worked at normalization of relations between the countries. Normalization. Oh, there's no such word. It's an Americanism. I know there's American English and Australian English. In fact, there isn't. There is the Queen's English and everything else is simply a mistake. The diplomats tried to normalize relations between the countries. What about this? The two cars drove, is that the right verb? The two cars drove at a fast pace, so we got now an adverbial phrase, down the road, as they each tried to outpace the other. Well, is that what they did then? They drove at a fast pace trying to outpace each other, because I know another verb that describes an activity like that, which seems to be much more appropriate. The two cars raced down the road. It's more precise, it's more descriptive, and it's more descriptive using fewer words. Better, isn't it? Right, here's a little exercise for you. What do I mean here? The company's business was the importation, there's the noun. Now it's the past tense. What's the verb here? What did the company do? The company what? The company is the subject. The main verb is going to be the correct version of the verb import. Let's have a look what we got here. Imported, the absolutely HP, absolutely right. Let me show you, it's imported. So let's put it in the active voice in the sentence. The company imported fine china. Isn't that shorter and easier and more direct? Let's have a look, he's also saying this. Ah, oh, thank you, Emma. Thank you, Vincent, Sumaya. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anna. Now, his crime was a big surprise to his friends. Well, surprise isn't the right verb then, is it? 
This is a verb, all right, but it's not the right verb. If it's a big surprise, what's more than a big surprise? What's a, it's, it's more than just a synonym, it's a big surprise. So what might that be? It's more than surprise, I was what? This time I'm gonna to have to call you to draw upon your knowledge of the English language. Let's have a look what we got here. 13, 14, let's see a few more of you join in. Right, let's see. We've got a couple of potential correct answers here. Let's have a look what we've got. Shocked, excellent. His crime was a shock to his friends. Well, Frederica, yes, but let's put it in the past tense. Isoda, yeah, shocked. Astonished, great, Priya, great. Shocked or astonished? Wondered, not so much. Shocked, yes, shocked. Let me show you. Make sure of your spelling, by the way, everybody. I know you're racing to give me these answers. Obviously, after you've written something, you'd go back and edit it by correcting the spelling and grammar mistakes. That's what effective writing is all about. His crime astonished his friends, or equally good, his crime shocked his friends. Great. Now, what about the next one? He spoke to the crowd, spoke in a loud voice. Well, what, <laughs> what's the verb to describe when you speak to people in a loud voice? I stand three, one meter away from you, and I speak to you in an extremely loud voice. What do you normally say that is? We don't call it speaking, we call it something else. What is that, everyone? Yes, to shout, screamed. You're right, Mahmoud. Shout or screamed or yelled, Georgia. Great, great, Aliena. Yeah, great. Yeah. Now put it in the past tense, everyone. So it's not shout, is it? It's... Make sure you, you put these verbs in the right tense. It's the past tense, so he shouted. Right, next one. This time, we've got a noun. Mac gave a lecture. Well, what did he do? It's the past tense of the verb. The verb is to lecture. What's the past tense of to lecture? He didn't give a lecture. What did he do? Turn it into a verb. Let's have a look. Yeah, he lectured. Very good, Mala. Very good, Anna. Very good, Samaya. Good, excellent. Anna, excellent. Mac lectured the court. See how much shorter it is? And what about this last one? Again, we're only going to cut out one word, but we're going to change the noun, and by doing so, we can get rid of the other verb. Committed, that's a verb. Discrimination, that's a noun. So what did the company done? The court found that the company had what? I'm not trying to make any political point. I wrote this you know, a long time ago. Right. What had the company done? Past tense, remember? Turn discrimination into a verb. Put it in the past tense. Say it will be discriminated. Discriminated against. By the way, as a preposition, and we're going to look at prepositions in the next lesson, it's discrimination against. To start a court case against, discrimination against women. Court found the company had discriminated against women. Okay. Now, next thing. While writing with precise verbs, you'll shorten your sentences, you'll be more precise, you will create greater impact, which is what you want with your writing. You want it to stand out from your colleagues and your competitors and the other writing you put in front of the arbitrators or the judges. You, or a report, or a client. You want it to stand out. Once your writing stands out from your colleagues, you'll get noticed at work. It's one of the ways to get more rapid promotions. Okay, now, we're overrunning a bit, but I want to do this. Here's a little exercise. Change the following nouns into verbs. Well, we won't do all of these. We'll put this presentation on the website in a few days. We've got the answers to these exercises. What's, uh, what's the noun? Action becomes what? To, to do what? Yeah, to act. Let's go down. Uh, what's number seven? Let's jump down. Let's jump down to number seven. Application is the noun. To make an application. An application. They're both nouns, okay? To make an application, the, the noun for the process. What is the verb? To 
got to change the spelling slightly. What is the verb? Oh, 32 of you. Oh, I think to, to apply. Well done, everyone. Well done, Sarah Janival. Well done. Okay. And uh, I'm going to leave. Well, I'll do one more. Four. Discussion. The verb is what? We, we will what with this matter? This is too easy for you, so I'm going to move on. Let's have a look. Yes, great, Frederica. Great, Chiara. Great, Hammer. Olga, Daniela, Adriano, Aprojen. Thank you very much. Oh, two more come in as well. Wow. Sumaya Ab Abdel Ghaffar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abdel Ghaffar. Salama. Thank you. Right, to discuss. Well, let's have two of these. Right, what about number four? Make your submission online via the planning portal. What word should we change there? Which word in number four? Just one word. Let's have a look what you're doing. You're all doing very well. Submission. Yeah, we're going to put it to submit, as you say, Adriano. Yeah, Guyi. Oh, thank you, Guyi. Adriana, great, great, great. Submit online via the planning portal. Very good, Mark Mood. Polite, concise, and to the point. Make your submission online via the planning portal becomes submit whatever it is online via the planning portal. Not make your submission. Get rid of that make your, get rid of that verb and that pronoun. Now, Let's move on to the last part for today. We're going to be another 10 to 15 minutes, then we'll finish. Legal vocabulary. Well, I know that those of you from Romance country languages, those of you who speak French, Italian, Spanish, or Portuguese, may not have too much difficulty with legal Latin words. The rest of us do. Even though English is 70% based in Latin, it, it still causes problems because a lot of these Latin words and phrases have been given specific legal meanings. So even if we can translate them from Latin into English, it doesn't tell us what it means. Res ipsa loquitur, the thing for itself speaks. The thing speaks for itself. Well, what does that mean? It means in legal terms, the situation is so obvious I don't need to give any other further explanation. So it's not just knowing the Latin, it's understanding the words. Now we've entered the 21st century, it's considered very old fashioned to use legal Latin in your correspondence. However, because the first lawyers back in Britannia 2000 years ago, well, 1500 years ago, the first lawyers after the Romans left were the priests who spoke Latin. There's a lot of Latin in the English law. Some of these phrases have a legal meaning. We call them terms of art, meaning they have a legal meaning. Mutatis mutandis. Everything in this document that needs to be changed has been changed. Mutatis mutandis, meaning everything that needs to be changed has done so. Contra preferentum. We use Latin all the time without realizing it. Etc. Per annum. Vice versa. Contra. They're Latin words that have come into the English language. But these Latin expressions have a legal meaning, and when they have a proper legal meaning, it's perfectly acceptable to use them. Other times, don't use Latin. The whole purpose of legal writing is to be understood that your message, questions, ideas will be understood by the reader. You're not writing to show how clever you are, how many long words you know. You're not writing to use sesquipedalian language. My favorite word, sesquipedalian. It means one and a half feet in Latin. It means using words that are so long, nobody understands them. Your writing to be understood. Mark Twain said, never use a complicated word when a simple word will do. That is good advice. So we're going to look at some of the more frequently used Latin terms, and then you'll have a choice in the exercise as to whether you use the Latin term or the plain English expression in future. And my advice is, Use the plain English expression. That way, when you write to a lawyer in a non-native English speaking country, let's say you're a lawyer in Brazil writing to a lawyer in China, why on earth would you try to communicate in Latin? Just write in English. There's a much better chance you'll be understood.
So consensus ad idem. Well, I've mentioned this already. It's important in contract writing. It means a meeting of the minds. It means both parties know and understand what they're agreeing to. Res ipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. This relates to a situation where the facts are so obvious they need no explanation. The locus in quo. This means the place where something happened. Mutatis mutandis means all the necessary changes have been incorporated into the document. Ad hoc means for this one purpose only. It's used as an adjective before a noun, an ad hoc committee, a committee with only one purpose, an ad hoc resolution, a resolution for just one purpose. Et ali, shortened usually to et al, it means and others. It's usually used at the end of a list of people. It's used to shorten the list of people so you don't need to mention every single name, etc. While well, used like et ali, we just put etc, meaning et. It means other things of the same kind. This is though, so we're listing not human beings, but items, maybe animals, cats, dogs, pigs, goats, donkeys, cows, etc. that you will find on a farm. That means goats, dogs, etc. It doesn't mean jaguars, panthers, lions, and tigers, because you don't hopefully find too many of those on your farm. Exemplar grazie. We shorten to EG. Whenever we see EG in writing, we don't say EG, we say the English. For example, we use this when we're giving examples. Idest. Again, we just put the initials IE. Idest means that is. When we see the, the initials IE in writing, we say the words that is. It's used as an explanation. There's one thing wrong with this contract i.e. it is too long, okay? There's one thing wrong, that is, it's too long. Per se, means by itself. For example, a, a, an adult human can conduct legal proceedings per se, I mean, by themselves. They don't need anything else. Sick, uh, this is very useful when you have to repeat the words written or spoken by somebody else in court proceedings and they've made a mistake, a spelling mistake or a grammar mistake. You repeat their words and immediately after the mistake which you've noticed, you put the words SIC, meaning it wasn't me that created this mistake, I'm just pointing out their mistake. Versus, right, means against, it's Latin. We normally abbreviate it to V. When we see it in a case citation, Smith, vs jones we don't say verses for some traditional reason we just say and smith and jones de facto means in fact ipso facto means by this fact inter alia inter means between alia means things other things aliens inter alia amongst other things usually again when you're providing a list per annum note the spelling of this and don't make a mistake with it means each year or annually. Pro forma means for the sake of protocol. For example, I ask you for an invoice for the work you did six weeks ago, which I paid you for six weeks ago, but I need the invoice for the tax records. I want a pro forma invoice. Pro rata, very important in company law, means proportional, according to the proportion already existing. A quorum, important in company law, the minimum number of people needed to make a vote in a business. Sui juris, meaning the ability of a person. Juris, of course, relates to juries. Law, the ability of a person to bring a legal action in their own right. Ultra virus, very important in company law, administrative law, beyond their lawful powers. Ultra, beyond. Virus, their living powers beyond the lawful powers of the person or body, exceeding their lawful authority. Vide licit, usually written as V-I-Z, means already seen. We've already seen this before in the contract. Viz, vide licit. Well, at least I think that's how they're pronounced, because nobody really knows. There aren't any ancient Romans around to tell us what the pronunciation is like, but I think this is how they're pronounced. Now, of course, there's hundreds more legal Latin words. There are, in fact, around 3,000 important legal words and phrases that you should know to practice legal English properly. 
That's too many to learn, other than through years of practice. However, let me remind you, you can get rid of 50% of them by not using Latin at all, because they're considered very old-fashioned. So if you haven't got time to learn all 3,000 phrases and words, you can cut out the Latin one straight away and use modern English instead. Now, I want you to win arguments, win cases, by the logic of your argument, the strength of the evidence, and your ability to write effectively. However, you will find, especially amongst some very much older lawyers, they attempt to intimidate their younger legal opponents by using Latin as if to show, look how much Latin I know, I must be more experienced and better than you. Well, that may have worked in the second half of the 20th century, but it certainly doesn't work in the 21st century. This tactic is no longer effective. So I advise you, quite frankly, take a course in legal writing or persuasive writing. I'm not the only company, ours isn't the only company to promote these courses. We have our own courses, other companies have courses on. Take those courses to polish and perfect and give your writing impact. That's how you want to win the case, with the force of your argument, not because you use lots of Latin. However, at the top of the next slide, we're gonna have a little exercise. At the top of the next slide, there are 15 Latin phrases. And below it, there are 15 modern translations. And below that, or, and in addition to that, 15 incorrect phrases, just to confuse you. They're all out of sequence. Can you match the legal phrase with the correct definition? Now, I've have, to an extent helped you out a bit. Here's questions one to five. You'll find the answers questions one to five amongst answers A to G immediately below it. All right? So, actus reus. Does anybody know what this is? It's from criminal law. We haven't looked at this in the presentation. Does anybody know this? There are two parts to committing a crime in many common law crimes. There's the guilty mind, which is the mens rea, and there's the physical act. So what is actus reus? It refers to the physical act. What is it? G, very good, very good, Mohammed, very good, Apogeng. The guilty act, the actual act. What does in camera mean? Number two. <laughs> Somebody's written. <laughs> I didn't put the green line there, but there's a clue. <laughs> there's a clue on the screen by a green line that's appeared. <laughs> let's let's see if everybody's got it. In camera means B. Quite right. In chamber it means in secret. Because of security reasons, you must hold the hearing in court without the public being present. What now from contract law? especially re relevant in the Middle Ages, but still relevant today. Caveat emptor. What does that mean? Oh, oh, beg your pardon. It's in the, the, the third group of words. It's not in the first group of words. Caveat emptor, between O to T. Which word, is, which, which is it? Between O to T, caveat emptor. Very good, those of you who've got it. You must have looked at comparative law, I imagine, or no contract law, or the history of contract law, very well. It's O, quite right. Let the buyer beware. Caveat, caution. You put a caveat on the land, a caution to stop people buying it. Emptor, beware. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. In other words, check the goods before you buy them, otherwise you might not be able to change them if there's something wrong with them. Et al, again, this is between A to G. What, what does it et al stand for? Good. A, quite right, among others. Right, let's move to the next. Uh, his, his, uh, how am I supposed to know? Well, Mark Wood, this is, <laughs> well, this is really just to have people to test themselves to show you really that you need to do a bit more reading of, of, of Latin. Uh, again, as I said, perhaps one of our legal writing, our legal English course. What about seven? Here's a phrase you may know habeas corpus. And again, this, for some reason, I'm sorry, I haven't sorted these out correctly. This is in the answers A to G, habeas corpus. It was a very important part of common law. We lost it when we joined the European Union. When we leave the European Union at the end of this year, we'll get it back. And it's a very important civil right. 
The Americans have it and the British want it back. We invented it. We'd like it back. E, quite right, you have the body. It's an order to the authorities to produce the body of the person they've arrested. Meaning, if he's alive, show him to us in court. Produce him in court. In other words, you can't arrest people and not take them to court. Okay. Well, I'm going to put this on the website. And you'll be able to download it in a few days and complete this exercise yourself. The answers to all these will be added to an extra slide before we put it on the website. Right, well, that's all for today, everybody. Let me stop sharing and bring myself back on the screen. Well, look, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, we'll have more lessons, of course. Next week, I have a book, uh, which I think I'll give as a free gift to everybody as well. I wrote something, it's about 70 or 80 pages, on how to select your career, how to get work experience, how to get an interview, how to conduct yourself in the interview, how to begin your legal work in the law company to get noticed, how to get a rapid promotion, etc. It's advice on the start of your legal career. It's all the things I wish I had known when I first qualified. I don't know, I mean, as everybody's under lockdown, it's only about 80 pages. You might not want to read 80 pages, it's quite useful. And uh, I'll offer that as a free present to everybody it turns up. To those of you who celebrated, happy Easter. To the rest of you, enjoy your weekend. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Jenny Val, thank you very much for getting up so early to join us. Uh, by the way, we'll be uh, announcing the launch of our first Legal English courses in uh, Brazil next week. And my colleagues, my new partners in Brazil, will start the courses in about two to three weeks from now in Sao Paulo, both online and live. So uh, I hope you'll uh, stay uh, tuned for that and we'll send out all the information shortly. For anybody in Angola, uh, we're about to announce uh, a new course purely for lawyers in Angola. And I, those of you from China, just to let you know, our new website for China should come should go live in about three weeks, which will give you much better, much better broadband speed. So there shouldn't be any buffering or problems with downloading the broadcasts or the recorded lessons. Obviously, I'll keep everybody informed of this during this lockdown period, because it's important in our progress. And for those of you in Croatia, we're about to, in the next week, our new partners in Croatia will be announcing an arbitration law and practice course, which will start in about two weeks from now. Vincent, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you found that of interest. The yes, difficulty is knowing, because it's a blend of so many different courses, it's a difference in knowing how much technical information to bring in. But I thought just the basic concept of our contract is written might be useful yes. although normally that's really contained in our contract drafting course mm -hmm. yes absolutely and normally I, I have a lot of experience i'm an experienced lawyer but um i've been sick for several years and oh. uh, i haven't worked for several years and i need to to, to learn again to restart oh, well. so that's why well, I'm, go, and have I'm, a look. Go, go and have a look at the pre-recorded version of our contract drafting course i didn't you know i haven't used these as a sales well I haven't given anybody a hard sell yet, but I should tell you, we're giving a 20% discount during the uh, lockdown period. So the entire contract drafting course, 15 hours of it, the pre-recorded version, is just $192 now with the discount. So yeah. you might want to have a look at it. Try and order a free trial lesson, see if it suits your purposes. It might yeah. be what you want to just polish up your knowledge yeah. again. Mm -hmm. I will look. Okay, thanks everyone. Well, I will sign off. Lovely to see everybody. Have a great weekend and see you again next week. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye.